Okej, okay, dobra, witam wszystkich owca Buka z tej strony. Auzarak. Kłania się nisko. Zacznijmy od początku. Dostałem pytanie od Daniela Frankowskiego na moim Instagramie, które Wam przeczytam teraz. Cześć owca, piszę do Ciebie, ponieważ mam niby proste, ale też trudne pytanie. Chodzi o to, że chodzę na siłownię już jakiś czas. Moim celem oczywiście było zrobienie masy, a potem fajnego wyglądu. Ćwiczenie na początku było przyjemnością, lecz jakoś po roku zaczęło mi brakować motywacji. Coraz rzadziej, rzadziej, rzadziej odwiedzałem siłownię, a jak już to robiłem, to bez przyjemności. Tylko z przymusu. Mam więc do Ciebie pytanie, co Cię motywuje do pracy nad sobą i dążenia do celu? Czy to tylko dobry wygląd, czy coś więcej? I jest to dobre pytanie. Zdecydowanie dobre pytanie i myślę, że nie tylko Daniel zastanawia się nad tym. Dzięki Daniel za to, że do mnie napisałeś. Ok, co mnie motywuje? We wcześniejszym materiale z New Winter Games wspominałem, tam rozmawialiśmy o grach ogólnie. I ja z gier zawsze sobie najbardziej ceniłem element rozwoju, element progresji. I moje ulubione gry były to RPG. Szczególnie osadzone w, jakiś uniwer w jakimś uniwersum, które mi odpowiadało, którym się interesowałem, na przykład Bizne Wojny, Kotor i tak dalej. Sprawdźcie Kotora, jeszcze raz to powtórzę. Knights of the Old Republic. Ale okej, okay. nie lubiłem gier, kiedy progresja była tak zwana turowa na chwilę i po turze traciłem to, co udało mi się wypracować. Lubiłem cały czas powoli odkrywać nowe rzeczy, przecierać nowe szlaki, rozwijać tą postać. I Myślę, że to samo mogę powiedzieć, mogę porównać naturalną kulturystykę i trening siłowy do takich właśnie gier RPG. Co mnie najbardziej motywuje w treningu siłowym jest to element progresji, stałego rozwoju i zwykła ciekawość, co mogę zrobić naturalnie, a czego nie mogę zrobić naturalnie. Czy uda mi się kiedykolwiek podnieść 280 kg na, na martwym naturalnie, czy nie uda mi się tego zrobić na przykład. I też to gdzie mogę zabrać swoją sylwetkę, jak nisko mogę zejść z tłuszczem, jak bardzo mogę się rozbudować, przepraszam, podczas okresu masowego na przykład. Ale nie zawsze jest tak, że tą motywację mam oczywiście. Zauważyłem, że jest tak, że nawet jeżeli coś bardzo lubimy, przykładowo lubisz grać w gry, to nie potrzebujesz motywacji, żeby zagrać w tę grę. Po prostu robisz to, bo lubisz to robić. Ale czasami się wypalamy i nawet to, co jest nam najbliższe, przestaje być dla nas już aż takie ekscytujące, bo to jest rutyna, to jest normalne. Co robię w takich sytuacjach, to zdecydowanie patrzę też na innych naturalnych zawodników, szczególnie z zagranicy. I dzisiaj będzie rozmowa z Alberto Nunezem. Jest to zawodnik, którego obserwowałem od początku swojego inteligentnego trenowania. Czyli to będzie już czwarty rok, w zasadzie od początku, kiedy Zaczęliśmy promować e, ten system jedzenia IFYM, jedz co chcesz. On już mi był znany. I imponowało mi to, jaką jest w stanie osiągnąć sylwetkę, ale nie tylko to. Bo jak szukam motywacji w innym zawodniku, to nie patrzę tylko... Taki przykład, na przykład La Lazar Angelov, świetna sylwetka, wiadomo, taki badass look, ale do mnie to jakoś nie przemawia, ze względu na to, że Lazar jest dla mnie taki... Nijaki po prostu. Nie ma tej osobowości i jeżeli chodzi o ten sport, o naturalną kulturystykę, zawsze lubiłem patrzeć na osoby, które nie tylko mają super sylwetkę, która mi się podoba, ale dwa, jest to coś, co ja myślę, że mogę osiągnąć, dlatego to mnie pcha dalej, popycha mój rozwój, ale też patrzyłem na ich osobowość, czyli to, jakie mają podejście do treningu, nawet do życia, do aspektu diety, odżywiania i tak dalej, i tak dalej. I zdecydowanie takim moim idolem, jeżeli chodzi o kulturystykę naturalną, jest właśnie Alberto Nunes. Jest to dla mnie taki Kobe Bryant koszykówki, albo nie wiem, Cristiano Ronaldo piłki nożnej. 
Także podczas dzisiejszej rozmowy z nim porozmawiamy sobie o kulturystyce naturalnej, o idei kulturystyki naturalnej, o tym dlaczego IFYM, jest co chcesz, jest źle interpretowane, o medycznych walorach, jest co chcesz, czy jest zdrowe, czy nie i paru innych rzeczach. Jest to chyba pół godziny rozmowy. Dla tych, co potrzebują, możecie włączyć napisy na dole w YouTube playerze i oglądając ten materiał, miałem wrażenie, jak mi się cofnął z angielskim o 5 lat wstecz, ze względu na to, że po prostu zdecydowanie byłem zestresowany podczas tej rozmowy bardziej niż zwykle. No i co? Myślę, że nie będzie to materiał dla każdego. Wiele osób z Was być może już zna Alberto Nuneza, ale myślę, że większość nie. Dla tych, co śledzą naturalną kulturystykę zachodnią, myślę, że to będzie fajny materiał, bo znacie Nuneza i zadałem mu takich parę pytań, których nie mogłem znaleźć wcześniej w jakichś wywiadach podcastach i tak dalej. Natomiast dla nowych osób zobaczycie jego formę, zobaczycie to, co on jest w stanie zrobić naturalnie i ja w to głęboko wierzę, że on jest naturalny i to jest moja opinia i jedziemy z materiałem. There we go. Can you see me right now? Now I can see you. Yes. All right. Yes. Great. Uh, just to get it, like, I'm sure it's pronounced very similar to Michael, so it's Is that what you go by? Uh, yep, Michael, Michał uh, in Polish. And I'm sure you're not going to be able to pronounce my uh, surname easily. No, that's, 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 that one's a little bit more. I didn't even try that one. Uh, we'll, we'll Come go on. First basis. Uh, well, I was like missing some vowels based on like my English. Uh, so. But you're we'll Spanish. I mean, you have like uh, Spanish origins. Yeah, it's uh, but Spanish is such an easy language. Like the rules are so simple. English is very difficult. I'll tell you that. But so, you know, r, 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 so you know it should be easier definitely for you. <laughs> that's the only hard part. Uh, so let me give it a try. Uh, Al Zarak. It's of Chazak. Oh. Of Chazak. So come on, once again. Wow, like you say that, and you make it sound so simple, but oh man, uh, one more time. Of Czarzak. Michał of Czarzak. Wow, okay. No, no, that's just too much, man. Too uh, much. Come on, <laughs> one last time. Last name only. Say one more time. And I'll get it. I'll get it perfectly. Of Czarzak. Of Czarzak. Wow! That was like 100% native Polish. Really? Awesome. I mean, one time I'll come out like that. And then fast, that's it. fast learner here. Uh, just in short, to tell you, we have this movement in Poland, uh, basically IFYM and stuff, and we get a lot of positive uh, feedback. We get a, a lot of negative one uh, because uh, of you know how uh, IFYM is being actually the same stuff as, as you guys have in America, and also uh, we get hate because we promote natural bodybuilding. So you know the drill as well. A little bit stressed because obviously I've been watching it for four years and you know I can feel excitement. Alberto Nunes, natural pro bodybuilder here for DMJ. Why natural bodybuilding? And what kept you motivated uh, to stay natural? Well, I think honestly, in short, the the main thing was um, I. First of all, I don't like the enhanced look, the modern day enhanced look. I just I don't like it, um, and then. At the very core of it, it just comes down to the fact that I don't, I see it as almost an intellectual cop out. So it's almost like mentally, uh, you're saying I ran out of ideas. Like I don't know how to progress anymore. And I'm just too curious of a person by nature to just say, you know what, we're just going to use that as the one answer. You know, I don't want to cheat on my test. I want to study hard and pass the exam so totally understand this one yeah it's just one variable and i i'd rather not do it that way mm -hmm. for how long you've been training now uh it's uh 13th year if i'm not mistaken it's it's just recently yeah this last year was the 15th year 15th year okay year um and yeah no it's, it's pretty crazy because when i started training i was 16 so if you were to tell that 16 year old that you going to be training for close to that amount of time pretty soon like that would just blow me away so um, it's the one thing in my life that um, has remained relatively unchanged so it's the one passion that I'm still as excited about today today's training session later today 
as excited as I was when I was 16. So that never goes away. Wow. Um, and, um, you know, because uh, here in Poland, uh, we get accused of uh, using drugs. And the main, like, the main thing is uh, that we gain too much weight over the course of the short uh, period of time, you know? So basically, let's say I, I've gained uh, 18 kilograms, so that's about, um, I don't know now, it's like, okay, 50 pounds over the course of two years, and people seem to uh, not understand that this weight, it's not only muscle, it's like a uh, tiny percent of it is muscle, most of it is glycogen, is water, and, uh, uh, you know, I'm just curious. What is your what was your progress uh, within the, within the course of your first two years of training, two to four years maybe? What was your weight gain? Yeah, so I think um, well, initially once I kind of got done with sports, because um, I was always always trying to combine lifting with sports, and it doesn't always work well, especially when you're trying to gain weight to have other sports alongside of bodybuilding. But once I really specialized in bodybuilding. I think uh, the first few years, I think I gained about 60 pounds, to be quite honest. Um, and it wasn't all muscle, but, you know, there was still, it was a relatively lean gaining phase. And um, I think when you are starting out, that is probably something that you should invest in, is perhaps a few periods where you let yourself get a little heavier than, than maybe you would like uh, or you think is best. Um, and then over time, obviously, um, you can just say the safest way to go about it or, or kind of project how much muscle you can gain is, let's just say the first year is 30 pounds of muscle. That's a lot, by the way, but very rare. But let's just say 30, then the next year maybe 15, and then 7. And then you can just almost keep cutting it in half every year. Um, and that's a pretty good estimate. So I don't get as heavy anymore because I can't gain, you know, four or five pounds of muscle a year anymore the way I used to when I was a young man. Um, but um, we do still gain weight in the off season. It just kind of reflects more than ever how much, what my growth potential is. So, which is very different between 15 years ago and now. Very different actually. Uh, yeah, so basically now during your off season, uh, you like to swing on the weight that is basically allowing you to progress. But if you're going to go too far with your weight, you're going to actually lose on your performance. Is that correct? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So if you go too far, eventually you have to go back and um, take that weight off. And um, one thing that, um, and this is, this is something that I'm sure you can relate to, is that as you have become more advanced, uh, it's easier to lose those more advanced adaptations. Uh, meaning, you know, when you first started training, you can take a week off and you can come back nothing, right? So yeah. Start right now. And now if you do that, you come back, you feel it. So uh, especially in the case of a more advanced bodybuilder, the more you have to diet off, the less ideal those conditions are for maintaining those adaptations and you risk losing those. It's a lot easier to root, to lose gains when those gains are on the more advanced stages. So, um, so yeah, as you become more advanced, it's probably more appropriate for you to not let yourself get much heavier. So I would say that, to be quite honest, my off-season weight gain compared to my stage weight is somewhere between, um, I'd say, 7 to 10 percent above my stage weight. That's as much as I let myself gain. And uh, I just progress between there because otherwise I risk losing mm -hmm. a lot of those adaptations with a huge diet. All right, so in numbers, basically your last show stage weight was how much? About 165. 165, and what is your current, uh, you know, I know you're swinging. Uh, I'm following you, but, you know, like an average weight now that you have during the off season. Right now it's about 175. Um, and the heaviest I got this off season was like low 180s. Um, so we're slowly building back up to that, but I won't let myself get heavier than that point, and then we just redo it again. And uh, to tell you the truth, as I become more advanced, say in another 10 years, I could see that window getting even sm smaller, where you know perhaps I only gain between 170 and 175 and just kind of keep it there. Um, 
So very different from someone who is starting. Someone who's just starting, I'm like, no, be a little optimistic, put on some body weight, and see what happens. You might be a mass monster and you not know it. Would you agree on this, uh, that during the first two to four years, most of people can uh, achieve 80% of what they are capable naturally? Uh, when it comes to muscle mass, you know, because of course, the longer you're training, you get more details on your body, your skin gets uh, thinner, definitely. Uh, but just, you know, talking about muscle mass, will it be like 80%? Yes, no, definitely. The first two to four years, that's a good place to hang around. It's going to be about 80% of uh, the total mass. So you will kind of know within the first two to four years, will I be a really big guy? Will I be a smaller guy? Will I be a medium bodybuilder? So yeah, first two to four years kind of let you know. Um, and then after that, even though you don't put on as much mass like you said, a lot of those fun details come in, you know, that, that uh, dense, grainy look, you know, that very complete look mm -hmm. starts to settle in and that's when it gets really fun actually. Yeah, first I wanted to, to show you probably your most uh, popular photo. Uh, okay, so it's this one. Uh, can you see it? Oh, that one, yeah. That yeah. yeah. So, what were your macros at this point? Um, I think that was second show that season. Um, so, my fat, I think, was like at 35.40. And then my carbs were, I think, right at 400. And then protein was at 200. So, 35.40, 400 and then protein at about 200 and I remember that day because I had just done a cardio session like that I really was not in the mood to do and okay. uh, I took the picture afterwards I'm like oh that was worth it then because uh, I had just started really going harder on my cardio but so yeah I remember that day very very clearly all right and uh, what's what is the type of the cardio that you did I mean because I know that you enjoy just walking uh, like us basically here uh, that, that's our you know preferable cardio and back then what was the cardio that you were doing well it was so convenient because literally the way in California it goes from flat to hill flat to hill and about a block from my house there was this one hill that um, actually was like 20 degrees up just right away it just goes from flat to 20 degrees so I would do that hill in the morning and didn't matter how tired you were or how slow you were going your heart rate was working going up that hill uh, but that morning it was like really cold really really cold I just wanted to sleep but I needed to get that cardio out the way so yeah it was uh, two miles up and then two miles down so about 400 calories of cardio I see so walking and you're gonna stick to walking this, oh, yeah. it's easy. You can listen to this, this, uh, this. Uh, you can listen to, to YouTube videos. You can yep. do all sorts of things. So it lets me multitask. I love that part. Great. And have you noticed maybe some kind of changes in your physique? Uh, right now you're living in Denver, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so there's colder uh, out there uh, comparing to um, California, obviously, and uh, yeah, changes in your physique, maybe less vascularity or, uh, you know what I mean. Yeah, um, I think the first thing was like the higher altitude, I remember like any like set that was like eight reps, uh, like I was feeling it, like it was just weird. Um, so that part was took a little bit of getting used to, to that. Um, and then um, everything else not so much, but the, the sometimes when it does get colder here, uh, and I'm, I don't know why I'm complaining to you guys, but um, <laughs> but it takes longer to warm up. It takes a lot longer to warm up. Uh, you, know, you go into the gym, and it's an extra 10 minutes of moving before you feel safe enough to squat or deadlift. But um, but yeah, that, that, those are the main things. The altitude at first, it took me a good month to like kind of be okay with that. And and how do you feel in uh, Colorado? Uh, you know, for example, when I go to Egypt from Poland, I feel much better because of the sun, the vitamin D, and when mm. I come back here during the winter time, uh, I, I just don't feel the same way, I just don't feel uh, this energy, maybe you regret moving to Colorado. No, here's, here's the thing about Colorado, and we don't like to tell the rest of the country this, is that uh, we actually, we're the state with the most sunny days. Uh, so how is that possible? 
Exactly. So it's 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 weird because like it will snow, and then later it's like sixty degrees and all the snow melted. Okay, I see. It's really crazy weather. So you get sun like there's no more sun today, but you get sun at least once a day every day, which is pretty pretty nice. Um, all right. But, so uh, I didn't know yeah. about it. I just you know I imagine Colorado as a freezing cold state. I was born in San Francisco, California. I prefer the weather here than San Francisco. Okay, that's uh, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah, very different. Okay, IIFYM uh, origins. Uh, you know, I uh, heard some rumors on the web, some rumors about about pop tarts and uh, your thread on bodybuilding forums. Yeah, so let's let's uh, let's uh, clear me of all crimes. Um, the, the whole pop chart thing was funny because that just really came from, um, so when I used to run track and field, I would run the 400 meters and that's just a painful race, very demanding yeah. painful race. And the only thing I could eat before it was pop tarts. Um, and I think ever since like that race, like or just running that race, I've always had this phobia of going to the gym with like a full stomach, even when dieting. Like I just hate feeling full when I'm in the gym. and. Um, during this one specific pre-contest diet, someone asked me, so like, what do you eat pre-workout? And I'm like, oh, Pop-Tarts, because um, if I get two Pop-Tarts in, I feel like I have enough carbs in me for that training session, and I don't feel full. So I like Pop-Tarts, and that's the only reason why, really, was just because of that. And then uh, over time, they just kind of became the symbol for, like, the IIFYM movement, you know? Yeah. And people were eating pop tarts they didn't know why they were eating pop tarts they just knew they just it was like uh it's like being a rebel almost right it's just like i'm having you know pop tarts and yeah. uh, you know laughing at the old school ways almost but it was just because of that because i could train in peace um but yeah yeah i remember when the whole iifym movement started and this was back in the bodybuilding.com message board forums in 2008 2008. That was a long time ago. Long time ago uh, yeah. And now it's taken off. Back then, no one really knew what it was, just maybe that little community. And now it's big enough to the point where, as you know, it causes conflict with people who don't necessarily know what IIFYM or flexible dieting really is. Yeah, so let's talk about uh, whether, you know, IFYM it's healthy or not, uh, basically. And uh, just. Uh, your point of view uh, based uh, on your career as a coach. Uh, you, li you like to be uh, named Coach Nunes, right? Uh, so that's uh, what they call me sometimes. Uh, yeah. It's still weird, but yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, let's say you have a guy that uh, has really large uh, calorie maintenance level over 5,000 calories. And what do you think will be healthier? Uh, to eat uh, best quality food full of fiber and obvious, obviously we know what happens when we consume too much fiber or just you know split it like healthy IFYM styles so let's say 70 80 percent clean 20 percent dirty uh, what would be healthier for, for that person um, yeah and, and you know what I think if we were to just like look at um, because when we look at the caloric demands of a bodybuilding, typically it isn't as high as some other sports out there. Um, there's only so much training we can, effective training we can do as bodybuilders before it's like counterproductive, right? So we don't use as much energy as a lot of other athletes do. Um, so uh, a lot of other athletes kind of have a mixed cocktail of, of food. You know, they they definitely. You know, they, they, they get some good food, but I think mostly a lot of bad food that kind of gets thrown in there, and they have to for their energy needs. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd say for a bodybuilder, at a certain point, um, it just becomes more practical to get some food that is not necessarily micro-dense, but is macro-dense, you know? Um, because, again, like, the main, one of the main concerns for a physique athlete is having your energy or your cal calorie balance where it needs to be. So lower when you're dieting, higher when you're trying to overeat and gain. And it's just too difficult and not practical if you're trying to get 
a diet full of foods that are micro dense and the thing is often a lot of those foods that are micro dense they tend to not be very macro dense so you have to eat a lot of those in order to fulfill your caloric needs um, so for, when it comes to just practicality um, I think some athletes especially during the gaming phase and especially young active men um, might need a good combination of like whole foods that are micro dense and then foods that are not necessarily so micro dense people who diet using flexible dieting formats is it <clears throat> just um, by default just naturally because you are under eating you're going to gravitate to a lot of foods that are not calorically very dense the those micro dense but not macro dense foods you're just going to do that naturally without uh, necessarily thinking about it and I'm sure you've experienced this on a diet where you could have that really yummy tasty food but at the end you decide to go with this one because it's more satiating and it, it uh, helps you stick to your diet makes the diet a lot less stressful um, so that's the cool thing about I'd say about flexible dieting is that it teaches people to make decisions and make the right decisions and I think that's something that kind of gets lost uh, when we talk about IIFYM and flexible dieting is the fact that it teaches you to make good decisions for yourself and it teaches you to look beyond like the menu and the paper and just what's on here it educates the person and I think that's why a lot of coaches that, or athletes bodybuilders that train other people don't want to necessarily like either learn about flexible dieting or teach the flexible dieting approach because there's an educational component to that. We have like few gurus here in Poland, medical nutritionists. They have really vast knowledge over many metabolic diseases. I definitely will give them a credit, but um, actually what they're telling is that counting macros doesn't make sense and it just it blows my mind basically they're saying that eat uh, whatever is healthy raw meat just non-processed food uh, and stuff don't count macros and you'll be fine so okay it's better to overeat over the course of 10 years with perfect uh, food selection or maybe just not be so perfect at food selection and count macros and actually uh, not to put on excessive weight because people do not realize that uh, your blood markers <clears throat> Sorry will improve uh, Whenever you will lose fat right and uh, you know same question about you know your trainees uh, from your from your coach perspective How that thing works on your trainees? Yeah, and that's an excellent point. I think uh, a big way and th that's just, this is just kind of how the whole um uh, I guess the nutrition industry has has worked for a while is that like it's yes or no foods bad foods good foods um, <clears throat> you know very black and white and again the I think the, the thing about flexible dieting that uh, is like I'm sure you've gotten this question at the gym is like you know what do you eat how do you do it and they, they want a one word answer they want you to say something like I stopped eating gluten and all of a sudden I got lean you know, and the truth is that when um, when you decide to commit to a flexible dieting format, is that there's going to be some education that takes place. And I'm sure that um, for you, like if you look at your flexible dieting a few years back compared to now, it's changed, and it's always going to constantly be changing. It's an adaptive diet, and that's why it's so successful because. It changes to when you're four weeks out from the show to when you know you're like deep into your off season where uh, to you know maybe you have a a maybe you're dieting for fat loss and you have a uh, dinner with the family you know so it's very very adaptive and to me the, it, it, it can be a lot of hard work to teach a person how to be that flexible to be that adaptive uh, and it might take a while and they might be discouraged at times but usually most people that go through with it two to three years later they're very glad that they did it this way that they are really really flexible that um, again the diet adapts to them almost and not the other way around what's the point to train if you're a slave exactly 
Yeah, you do this because it makes you happy, right? Yeah, definitely. I want to have something good after the workout, you know? I want to reward myself. Of course, if I'm closer to competition, I know that uh, I need to be picky with, with my food types, you know? But, you know, if I'm during off-season and I really do not care as much about my uh, fat, it, it just uh, makes this whole experience... Uh, much better overall uh, there are many people not blessed with your metabolism how much calories you actually consume during uh, the contest prep um it's uh, usually about three thousand, and that gets me pretty far and you weigh 165 totally understand that some people want to shoot you online uh um again a question based on on your coaching experience uh can you actually lower your set point after for example finishing dieting and using this popular common uh, reverse diet style uh, have you uh, got any examples when it comes to your trainees maybe they like uh, you know their metabolism went from 2500 to 3000 uh, during off season keeping the same uh, shape when it comes to you know fat partitioning you know the the your physiological uh, set point that's just kind of in your DNA you know and that's just basically um, that line that your body has to draw where if we get under this we're going to assume that you know we're starving and you know life isn't good right now um, and that's always going to be there however I do think that um, over time what you can do because you're, you're getting away from just this looking at physiological set point you're um, a lot of it comes down to psychology and what I mean by that is just improving upon our everyday habits um, and this is something that you will see over time that um, you just get better at adherence you get better at perhaps um, not using uh, using a more moderate surplus all those things, I think, over time improve. So uh, maybe uh, one thing that I will see frequently is not necessarily calories going up because, for example, over the last four years, I've lost about three or four hundred calories off my maintenance, and the main reason is because I used to work a much more active job. I used to work with uh, children primarily, and uh, they will keep you busy. So that's where my four hundred calories left is from running around with kids. Um, but I'm leaner now in the off season than I was then, and I think a lot of it has to do with just I'm better at adhering to a diet, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that I use a flexible dieting format. I'm able to format and adjust a diet to a way that uh, lets me stick to it and lets me keep a body composition that I like. Um, but a lot of that is is more behavioral stuff. Um, and I think that's why, like I tell my athletes, that this, these are your macros. This is kind of what I want you to do. But the athlete is the last person, the final customization. You know, they decide like what, like how much meals they should have per day, how much meals they, sh how much food they should have pre-workout, post-workout, those sort of things. So that's one thing that I think potentially can help a person stay leaner in, in the gaining phase, is uh, just really paying attention to what helps him adhere um, because adherence is an issue sticking to a diet is an issue for just not just people that go to the gym but some of my most advanced bodybuilders that I coach a big part of it is, is even with them is like learning to stick to a diet um, so that's one thing you will hear about flexible dieting and IIFYM is like oh you people just you know want the easy way out uh, but the truth is uh, human will there's only so much of that to go around right and um, I've known too many people that have burned themselves out to the point where they're no longer even in the sport because yeah. the diet yeah. format was too rigid um, so long long answer is that I think set point can change but what we can work on is like on ourselves mentally um, and I think that's one of the reasons that I'm much more leader in the offseason now than I was five years ago it's just mental uh, maturity. I know what I can handle, what I can't, what I can handle, uh, and what how to set myself up for success. So, uh, from the physiological 
uh, point of view, you cannot change your set point. It's only about mental uh, kind of capabilities, right? And, uh, yeah, and it doesn't adherence. necessarily mean learning, learning to tolerate more. It just means putting yourself in a better position. All right. Just wondering, uh, when you're like, uh, let's say, one week uh, out from your show, how do you feel? I mean, what what are your uh, energy levels? Yeah. Um, so I think um, my biggest thing for me personally, when I am dieting for a show, is uh, my blood <clears throat> my blood sugar levels are just kind of all over the place. And uh, like one minute I'll be like really high up and doing well, mm -hmm. and the next minute it's like I just I don't want to move. Um, so that's probably my first biggest issue is just that it's kind of all over the place. Energy is just kind of up, down, up, down, like instead of just like this. Yeah, I think it's, it's uh, <clears throat> what ends up happening is that you're so insulin sensitive, especially skeletal muscle, that it all goes straight into the muscle. And then like the blood sugar levels are just like, pfft. yeah, it's like your body's like throw more in there. Um, mm -hmm. But you can't because you're dieting, obviously. Um, <laughs> So I'd say that's the first thing, and then um, I, I'm a lot less patient when I'm dieting. Those are probably the two main things that I get. Everyone's symptoms are going to be very different. Some people, um, you know, have it worse than others, but I'd say probably those are the two main things, my blood sugar levels, and then I just become very not patient. I mean, if you were to tell me, like, a girl or, or like, pizza without macros, I'd be like, oh, pizza without macros. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so about the same yeah. here. Um, yeah, I okay. think that goes for anyone who's dieting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, one, th I, I really need to plug in those those books because um, I think for me, like that's probably the thing that I am most not necessarily jealous of this like generation, but I'm like I really wish you kids like would understand how fortunate you are. Um, and, and those books to me, they're they they're like I could have skipped over the first eight years of just like trying really hard and that's basically what made me progress was the fact that I wouldn't quit and try very hard. Um, they're just, they're, they're brilliant and I think especially for to the natural athlete, training is so important. Training is, you know, you hear that it's, it's, um, it's uh, what is it, 80% nutrition, 20% training and like to me, like you can probably turn those around and it's probably the other way around where if you were to tell me like, so train really hard and not watch your nutrition or watch your nutrition, hit your macros every day and not train. I'll probably train really, really hard and not watch my nutrition and I'll get some really good results. And what that pyramid book does is it, it's going to help you organize your training in the most efficient, effective way. So um, yeah, to me it's just one of those things where in a sport where I think more than any other sport out there, we are so dependent on science and making and science is what's going to really help elevate the sport. It's just funny to me that sometimes we don't choose to look that way. Um, so to me, yeah, those books, Eric Thomas' Screaming Series, just it's the greatest thing to happen to bodybuilding in the last, I'd say, five years. Um, I think I might have six months left of off season, and then I start my diet. And I'm really excited to, if I end up dieting, to I think this time is going to be by far the best ever and I just want to prove to people that um, you can progress even like really late into your bodybuilding career um, so that's what I'm excited about. I'm excited it's always exciting mm -hmm. as a coach show people you do this too so I'm excited to like and there's a little pressure obviously it's because I need to do something if I don't people can be like, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. Um, so I'm excited to prove it. So in six months, we started a diet, I think. All right, then. So, uh, Alberto, because we're losing connection once again, thank you very much for your time. All right. If I'm ever over there, we'll, we'll lift some weights and eat protein or something, okay? All right, then.